you have your Bible with you this evening, please take it out and go over into the book of Hebrews, to Hebrews the 11th chapter. Please go into your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 in just a moment. We're going to read a verse from that, from that text as you turn there this evening uh, and get yourself a little bit more comfortable. Let me just extend my appreciation on, on, and on behalf of my family for allowing us to be here this weekend. Uh, we believe we've had a wonderful weekend. We've really enjoyed ourselves, which are young people, some fantastic young people, many of them more. I remember when they were a little bitty, and now they're almost grown. And it's just amazing to see that. And I just appreciate you allowing us and inviting us to be here. Thank you so much. We love you so much. And, and we'll always be indebted to you for, for what you did for us nine years ago, giving us a chance to train in the gospel and prepare for the ministry. And we really appreciate it. We think about you all the time. We pray for you. We love you. And, and words just can't express how much we do love you. Thank you for all you've done for us. I want to begin this, this lesson this evening by, by, by asking you a question. And the, and the question is this. Where are you in your faith? Where are you in your faith? In other words, as you, as you sit there in, in that seat, I almost said pew, but as you sit there in that seat right now, where, where are you in your faith? Where are you in your faith? I ask you that question because I believe that the concept of faith ties heavily to the main goal that we should have as the people of God, and that is the goal of being all in for the Lord. That is the goal of being fully committed to Jesus, serving Jesus with all of our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, the importance of needing biblical faith cannot be overstated and helping us accomplish that goal. And I'm reminded of what we find here in Hebrews, the 11th chapter and verse number 6. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, notice the Hebrew writer says, and, and without faith, notice that. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. It is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Notice the importance of faith. Do you see that? Notice how we got to have faith. We must have faith as the people of God. That is what is being emphasized in this verse. That is what's being emphasized in this whole chapter. I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is this chapter right here, Hebrews chapter 11. I really love this chapter. I really love this chapter because in it, the Holy Spirit could commend so many people for having the kind of faith that pleases God. In this chapter, the Holy Spirit commends people like Abraham and Moses and Joseph and Noah and Sarah and Rahab and David and, and, and Samson. And the list goes on and on. I mean, the entire 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is devoted to the importance of faith. It is devoted to commending specific people who throughout the centuries had the kind of faith that pleases God. Here in this chapter, the Hebrew writer commends people who had great faith, but he's not the only one in the Bible to do that. I'm also reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to go in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 8. Please go to Matthew chapter 8. You know, it is interesting to me that while the Lord Jesus was on this earth, he talked a lot about faith, didn't he? He talked a lot about faith throughout his ministry over and over again. He talked about the need to have faith. He talked about the blessings that having faith can bring into your life. For example, in Matthew, the eighth chapter and verse number 10, here in the context, you have a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion who comes to Jesus, begging Jesus to, to heal a, a sick slave he had in his home. He really believed that Jesus could heal his servant. And I want you to notice how Jesus responded to this man's faith. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 10, the Bible says that when Jesus heard this, when Jesus heard this man's great faith, he marveled, notice that, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Notice how Jesus says this man had a great faith. Do you see that? He had a great faith. Now go to Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, we read another occasion when Jesus does this. Matthew 9 and verse 20. Matthew 9 and verse 20, we read about a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years. In fact, one account says she paid doctors a bunch of money and she still couldn't get well. And, and it says she was suffering for 12 years and she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his cloak for she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. 
And at once, immediately, this woman was made well. Notice again how faith, having faith, brought a blessing into somebody's life. And then we go to Matthew chapter 15. Look at one more example, please. Matthew chapter 15, I'm looking at verse number 8, or verse number 28, I'm sorry. Matthew 15, 28, here we read about a Canaanite woman, a Syrophoenician woman, who came to Jesus, begging him to cast the demon out of her daughter. She really believed that Jesus could do this. And, and the Lord responded in Matthew 15, verse 28, by saying, Oh, woman, your faith is what? Your faith is great. It should be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. There are a lot of other examples we could read when it comes to this, but I think you get the point. I, I think from this, you can easily see that throughout the gospel, Jesus commended people who had great faith. Throughout the Bible, Jesus blessed people who had faith. Throughout the Bible, Jesus put his stamp of approval on people who had faith. And ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear this evening about what we mean when we use that word faith. Let me tell you something. I certainly understand that for the most part in our religious world today, for a lot of people, they got a very distorted view about faith. I understand that if we were to ask 10 different people in Southeast Texas, what is your definition of faith? It's very possible we're going to get 10 different answers. I, 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 I'm well aware of the fact that the subject of faith is very controversial in our society today. I'm aware of that. I understand that, but let's be clear tonight what we mean when we talk about faith. Let's be clear when we point out tonight that if you want to have biblical faith, biblical faith has to do with belief. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Biblical faith has to do with belief. It has to do with belief in God, belief in Jesus, belief in God's ability to bless you in your life. Biblical faith has to do with belief and also has to do with conviction. It has to do with having a firm conviction or trust in the Lord. It has to do with, with trusting in the Lord's ability to do all that he has promised because of all he's done in the past. It has to do with belief. It has to do with conviction, and it also has to do with obedience. Oh, yes, it has to do with obedience. You see, we have real faith in the Lord. If we really believe and trust in the Lord, then those things should lead us to acting on what he has commanded. Those things should lead us to, to doing what he has told us to do. In James 2 and verse 17, James says, faith without works, faith without obedience is D-E-A-D, -E dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, these are critical components, critical components to biblical faith. The question is, do we have these things right here? Do we have these things? Do, do we really have the kind of faith that is necessary to please our Lord Jesus? In other words, if the Lord Jesus were walking around Beaumont, Texas right now, and he came into contact with us, what would he say about our faith? What would he say about my faith? What would he say about your faith? Would he look at us and, and commend our faith? What, would he look at you and say, oh, you have a great faith? Or would he look at you and say, oh, you have little faith? What kind of faith do we have this evening? If you don't mind, for a few minutes, I want to talk with you about that if I can. This evening, for a few minutes, I want to talk with you about faith. Specifically this evening, I want to talk with you about the kind of faith that pleases God. I want to talk with you about all-in faith. I want to talk with you about the kind of faith we got to have in our lives today if we're really going to glorify God. And here's the first thing I want us to understand as we cap off this, this weekend of, of talking about things concerning being all-in. This evening, I want to begin by saying this. Number one, if we're going to have an all-in faith, the first thing we got to understand is all-in faith, it has to come from the right source. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that, that the kind of faith that pleases God is, it has to come from the right source? That means it can't be founded as coming from the mind of men. And it can't be founded as coming from the mind of preachers. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Max or David or Ben or myself. It can't be founded as coming from your shepherds or from your deacons or from your Bible class teachers. Young people, this kind of faith can't even be founded as coming from your parents. And don't misunderstand why your parents are certainly supposed to be, are supposed to be teaching you the faith. While they're certainly supposed to be teaching you the Bible every single day, you still got to understand that the source of your faith can't be your parents. It can't be your parents. It can't be your friends. It, it can't be the things you may read in secular books. It can't even be founded in the things that, that you're able to see with your own eyes. You know, a couple of years ago, I was, I was blessed to go to Israel. 
I went to Israel for about two weeks. And I saw a lot of things, a lot of wonderful things, a lot of places we can read about in the Bible. I saw the Sea of Galilee. I went to the city of Jerusalem. I saw Nazareth. I saw Bethlehem. I saw a lot of wonderful things in Israel. And while seeing those things certainly helped my faith, while seeing those things certainly increased my faith and built up my faith, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. None of those things can still be the source of my faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, what does it say? We walk by faith and not by what? Not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. You see, my faith has to be founded in something beyond what I'm able to see or even want to see with my eyes. You see, according to the Bible, my faith and your faith, it has to be founded in the word of God. That's where it's got to come from, and I know that because of what the Bible says in Romans 10, 17. I know this is a verse many of us can quote, but let's read it like we're, like we're reading it for the first time. In Romans 10 and verse 17, Romans 10, 17, the apostle Paul says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or hearing by the word of God. Notice how if you want Bible faith, if you want the kind of faith that will lead you to being truly committed and all in for Jesus, then it's got to come from his word. It's got to come from hearing his word. It's got to come from reading his word. It's got to come from studying his word like you're doing right now. You see, Bible faith, it has to come from the Bible. It's got to come from the Bible, and that is why doing this right here is so important. That's why doing this is so important. You know, I've known for, for the last few years that you've been doing a Bible reading schedule here at Dallin Road. And may God bless you for that. We're, we're doing one at Jackson Heights this year where I, where I work. We, we need to be committed to reading our Bibles. We need to do things like this because Bible faith must come from the Bible. You see, the more you read your Bible, the more you're going to increase in your faith. People who are full of faith are also full of the Bible. Would you agree with that? You got to have the Bible in you. And so that's the first thing we got to understand about this kind of faith. If we want to all in faith, all in faith comes from the right source. But not only does it come from the right source, secondly, I want to show you now how this kind of faith also has the courage to be shared. The courage to be shared. I want you to go in your Bible now to Matthew 28, and I know for a fact that this church is well familiar with Matthew 28 and 19. If any church doesn't know these verses, you know these verses. Matthew 28 and verse number 19. Remember what Jesus said before he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. In Matthew 28 and verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice the marching orders our master gave us. Do you see it? Notice the, the, the mission the Lord gave us before he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Notice how our mission is the mission of going into the world and teaching the gospel. It's the mission of going into the world and making disciples of the nations. Those are the marching orders given to us by Jesus and throughout the book of Acts. Don't we read about the early disciples being busy about that work? They're busy about it in the book of Acts. It starts as early as Acts chapter 2, doesn't it? Acts chapter 2, there we read about the apostle Peter having the courage to stand up before a crowd of thousands in the city of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Keep in mind that just a few days prior, he was denying Jesus, afraid to even confess that he knew Jesus. But now he's having the courage to preach about Jesus to thousands. I'm also reminded of Acts chapter 7 where we can read about Stephen who preached the gospel to the Jewish Sanhedrin council, and then afterwards he was stoned to death. I'm also reminded of Acts chapter 8 and verse number 4, where there we read about the early Christians who lived in Jerusalem. They were forced to flee from that city. They were forced to flee from their homes, and yet they still went out preaching the word. And I'm also reminded of the great apostle Paul, who after he became a Christian, he spent the rest of his life traveling around the world, and having the courage to take the gospel even to the Gentiles. Ladies and gentlemen, all it takes is a casual reading of the New Testament to easily see that the early Christians were serious about the work of winning the lost. They were serious about fulfilling the marching orders given by Jesus, and the question is why? Why were the early Christians so serious about taking the gospel into the world even though during their time they could have been beaten, they could have been stoned, they could have been arrested. They could have had their heads cut off. Why are they so serious about preaching the gospel in a world like that? 
Well, listen very carefully. The reason they were so determined to tell people about Jesus, despite all the threats they faced, was because of their faith. You see, these people had real faith. These people had real faith in God, real faith in Jesus, real faith in the gospel, real faith in the Lord's ability to change people's lives. That's why they had the courage to share their faith with other people. And the question is, do we have that kind of faith? I mean, do we have the kind of faith that, give us, that gives us courage? Do we have the kind of faith that is so sold on Jesus' ability to change people's lives that we got to share it with as many people as we can? Do we have that kind of faith? I got to tell you, one of my favorite miracles of Jesus to read about in the gospel is in John chapter 2, when Jesus turned water into what? Water into wine. It's one of my favorite miracles. And unfortunately, I believe that so often we go to that story and we focus on the wrong thing. So often today we go to that story and we're focusing on the wine and whether or not the wine was fermented or unfermented. And don't get me wrong, I certainly believe that it was unfermented. I don't believe Jesus was contributing to getting people drunk at a party, okay? I do believe that it was unfermented, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is Jesus did a miracle. He turned water into wine. He turned one substance into another substance. And let me tell you, just like he had the power to change water into wine, he also has the power to change people. He has the power to change the homosexual. He has the power to change the thief and the liar and the adulterer and the fornicator. Jesus has the power to change everybody. And I know that because of what I read about in my Bible. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Will you please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6? I'm reminded of what Paul said to the Corinthians concerning some sins they, that they were involved in at one time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9, in verse 9 of the chapter, the apostle says this. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, such were some of you. You Corinthians, you at one time were involved in these things. You were homosexuals. You were fornicators. You were adulterers. You were drunkards. But you were sanctified. But, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified, declared not guilty in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. What I want you to notice is how according to Paul, Jesus changed these people. He changed them. Through his gospel, Jesus changed these people from terrible, wicked sinners to righteous children of God. That's what the Lord did 2,000 years ago for these people, and that's what he's still doing today. That's what he did to me, and that's what he did to you if you're a Christian. But we got to believe it. We got to believe it. You see, if you want to have an all in faith, you got to believe in Jesus' ability to change people's lives. All in faith has to come from the right source. All in faith has the courage to be shared with other people. But then, thirdly, I want to show you now how all in faith is, is a faith that is calm in the middle of storms. Calm in the middle of storms. Let me ask you something. You ever been through a storm before? I'm pretty sure that I'm talking to some people who a few years ago went through Hurricane Rita, right? Maybe there's even some folks here who went through Hurricane Katrina. There's some folks here who went through some storms. I've been through some storms too, some literal storms, and the apostles did as well. I want you to go in your Bible to Mark chapter 4. I know Ben read these verses this morning, and I was getting mad at him while he was reading these verses, but let's read them again. Mark chapter 4. I'm like, he's trying to steal my sermon. Just do Mark 5. What you doing? Mark chapter 4. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, look at verse number 35. Mark chapter 4, look at verse number 35, because here we read about a great story in the life of Jesus. Great, great story. And in Mark 4 and verse number 35, it says, On that day when evening came, he said to them, Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was stern, asleep in the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Why don't you let those verses soak in your heart again for just a moment? Notice, again, what we got going on here. We talked about it this morning. Here... 
We have the apostles taking a boat ride. They're taking a boat ride across the Sea of Galilee, but out of nowhere, boom, a, a storm pops up. There's a storm that pops up, and, and this storm is bad. In fact, it's so bad, notice the Bible says that waves are tossing and turning the boat. You got water coming in the boat, which is always a bad sign because, bad sign because water is not supposed to be in the boat. And the disciples thought they were going to die. They thought that this was it for them. They really did. But what was the Lord doing in the boat? He was sleep, sleep on the cushion, sleep on the pillows. We would say here in Texas, he was knocked out, wasn't he? He was asleep. He was knocked out. And the disciples, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe the Lord was asleep during this storm. And so they, they went to Jesus, which as a side note, is always the right thing to do first when you're going through a storm. Whenever you're going through something, the right thing to do is go to Jesus first. That's what they did. They went to Jesus, and notice what they said to him again in verse 38. They said, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? They didn't think Jesus cared. They didn't think he cared about the storm they were facing, but he cared about the storm, didn't he? In fact, after they asked that question, he got up, and he said three words to that storm. What were those three words? Hush or peace be still. Hush be still. He told that storm to be still, and what happened? The storm got still. It got perfectly calm. And then Jesus asked his, his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? In other words, are you still not aware of what I'm able to do? Do you still not recall all the miraculous things I have done up to this point? You should have known everything was going to be okay because you got me in the boat. You should have known everything was going to be okay. You see, here the Lord is telling his disciples that if their faith was where it should have been at this point, they wouldn't have been afraid, they, they wouldn't have to been afraid during the storm and said they could have been calm during the storm. The question is, what about us? When we're facing storms in our lives, and we all face storms, don't we? When we're facing storms, what do we do? Do we panic? Do we give up on life? Do we give up on Jesus? Do we lay in the bed all day feeling sorry for ourselves? Do we freak out and try to take matters into our own hands? Or do we trust Jesus? Do we have enough love and courage and faith in Jesus to, to stay calm as we go through our storms? Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what storm you're facing in your life right now. It doesn't matter if you're going through a financial storm or a job storm or a health storm or a bullying storm or a marriage storm, or a raising your children storm, or a sick and dying loved one storm. It doesn't matter what storm you're facing in your life. If you believe and trust in Jesus, if you keep him in your boat, you got nothing to fear. It's going to be okay. You're going to get through the storm. In fact, you're going to come out stronger and better for God after the storm is gone. I want you to understand it's the people who don't have Jesus in their boat, which is life. Those are the people who need to be afraid. Those are the people who need to worry. But people like us, people who are Christians, people who have Jesus in our lives, we don't need to be afraid during the storms. Instead, we need to trust him and remain calm and know he can take care of it. If you want to all in faith, you got to understand that faith is calm in the middle of storms. And not only is it calm in the middle of storms, number four, I want to show you now how this kind of faith also is willing to, willing to step out of the boat. Another way we could say this is this kind of faith will lead you to stepping out of your comfort zone. And I know that for a lot of people, when they hear that language, comfort zone, they think that's kind of cliche, but let me tell you something, I like it. I like that language. And I like it because I believe that so often as the people of God, that is exactly what we have. You and I both know that we have comfort zones. And let's talk about that a little bit. In fact, this reminds me of another boat story in the Bible, and this time it's in Matthew 14, and you know where I'm going, don't you? I want to talk about Peter. I want to go to Matthew chapter 14, and I want to talk with you about Peter here in Matthew 14. And if you start looking at the text around verse 22, you see that on this occasion, we find the story of Peter when he stepped out of the boat and walked on water. Remember that? On this occasion, we find the disciples, once again, they're taking another boat ride. <laughs> Take another boat ride, and this time, once again, another storm pops up. But on this occasion, it's about the fourth watch of the night, by 3 o'clock in the morning. 
A storm comes up out of nowhere at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they see Jesus walking on water during the storm. In fact, at first, they thought they were seeing a ghost. They saw the Lord walking on water during a storm, and once they realized it was him, he told them, don't be afraid, and I want you to know what happens next. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 28, in verse 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came, do came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. I want you to think about this carefully. I got to tell you, what Peter did here really took a lot of faith. Really took a lot of faith. I want to emphasize that to you because so often when we read this story, we're really hard on Peter, aren't we? So often when we read this story, we look at it and we say, oh man, bad Peter, shame on Peter. He began to sink into the water because, because he took his eyes off Jesus. So often we're hard on Peter when we read this story, but I want you to think about the other apostles. Think about them. Brothers and sisters, what were they doing at this time? What well, we remember, the text says that Peter had enough faith to get out of the boat, but the other apostles, they didn't even have enough faith to get out the boat. They stayed right there in the boat. At least Peter got out of the boat. You see, Peter's mistake here was not that he got out of the boat. He was actually obeying Jesus when he did that. Jesus told him to come. His mistake wasn't that he got out of the boat. His mistake is while he was walking by faith. He took his eyes off Jesus. That's when he began to sink. The question is, what about us? My friends, do we have enough faith to even get out the boat? And don't misunderstand. When I say that, I don't mean a literal boat. No, I'm talking about our comfort zones. I mean having enough faith to take some risk in our service for God. I mean, having enough faith to step out and invite our neighbor we talk to every day to worship service for the first time. I mean, having enough faith to step out from the pew and give a short talk on Wednesday night or a short talk at a, at a youth devotional. I mean, having enough faith to, to step out and invite somebody into our home for a meal for the first time, engage in hospitality for the first time in my life. I mean, having enough faith to step out and step up and try to be a leader in the Lord's church because you know we can always use more leader, leaders in the church. That's what I mean when I ask this question. Do we have enough faith to step out of the boat? And when we step out of the boat, do we have enough faith to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of faith? You know, Peter was doing pretty, pretty good with that for a while, wasn't he? I mean, he was actually walking on water for a time. Let me tell you, he, he's doing way better than I would have done. I wouldn't even got out of the boat because I can't swim. So I would have stayed right there. Peter did a whole lot better than me. He walked on the water for a little bit, but when did he begin to sink? When he took his eyes off Jesus. When he took his eyes off the Lord and he started focusing on that storm. That's when he had problems. And that same thing will happen to us. I want you to understand, anytime we, we step out of our boats in life, we can expect some problems. We can expect the winds to get a little contrary. We can expect some tossing and turning of the waves. There are problems all through life, but if we keep our eyes on Jesus, everything is going to be okay. We're not going to sink. Instead, we're, we're going to connect with him in ways we never thought possible. We're going to be able to do things for him and his kingdom that we never thought we would be able to do. You see, the Lord was not disappointed because Peter started walking on the water. He was disappointed because as Peter was walking, he took his eyes off him. That's when he got afraid, and we got to learn from his mistake. We got to understand that an all-in faith is a faith that comes from the right source. It has the courage to be shared. It's calm in the middle of storms, steps out of the boat, and then finally, it's also confident, confident in the promises of God. Confident in the promises of God. Go in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 10. I want you to go to the Gospel of Mark, please. Mark chapter 10, and look at verse number 33. Mark 10, 33. 
I want you to notice what the Lord says here to his apostles on this occasion. Mark 10, 33. Jesus said, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and, and, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. Notice the promises the Lord made his apostles on this occasion. Notice he promised to one day be taken from them, to be beaten to be spit on, to be mocked, to be crucified on the cross, but rise from the dead on the third day. That's what the Lord promised. And do you think the apostles believed in that promise? As you think about that, go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, look at verse 14. Mark chapter 16, verse number 14, it says, Afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. I want you to notice how after seeing all the Lord had done, after hearing all the truth of the gospel, after seeing all these miracles he performed over and over again, they still didn't have enough faith to believe that he would do what he said he would do. They still didn't have enough faith to believe that he would be raised on the third day. They did not believe that initially, and that certainly made the Lord upset on this occasion. He was upset. In fact, he was so upset and so disappointed that he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. I mean, after all they had seen the Lord do in his ministry, by this time, they should have known he was going to keep his promise. They should have known that. The question is, what about us? Do we have enough faith to believe that the Lord will do what he has promised us? Someone says, what has the Lord promised us? Well, I'm reminded of the promise found in Matthew 28 and verse 20, where there Jesus promised to be with us even to the end of the world. He says he's going to be with us in our daily lives. He says he's going to be with us while we go out and do evangelism, while we go out and do his work. Do we believe he can keep that promise? I'm also reminded of the promise found in James 5, 16, where the Bible says the fervent, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Notice how the Bible says that, that our prayers can change things. Our prayers can change the world. Our prayers can positively impact other people's lives. That's what the Bible says. The question is, do we believe that? Do we believe in the promise of the Scripture? And I'm also reminded again of the promise found in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Remember the second part of that verse, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Do we believe in that promise? Do we have faith that as we labor for our Lord on this earth, he sees everything that we're doing, nothing we do goes unnoticed by the King of Kings. He sees all that we do, and he will reward us when he comes again. Ultimately, he will reward us with a crown of life and peace and safety in heaven. Do we believe that? Let me tell you something. Because of all the Lord has done in the past, because he's never made a promise he could not keep, because he cannot lie, because he was raised from the dead, we have nothing but good reason to have faith in his ability to keep this promise and every other promise he's made us in the Bible. He is faithful. What I just want you to see tonight is all in faith looks a certain way. Do you see that? All in faith looks a certain way. The question is, do we have this kind of faith? Do we have the elements that are consistent with these things we've learned from the Bible? I want to suggest to you we got to have these things if we're going to have the kind of faith that truly pleases Jesus. And so that's my lesson tonight. Thank you for listening so carefully. We're going to sing a song in just a, a few seconds. Thank you so much. I want to close tonight by asking you this. Where are you in your faith right now? Where are you in your faith? Are you walking by faith? Are you living a life of faith? I want to submit to you that if you have never obeyed the gospel, if you've never done the things necessary to become a Christian, you're not really walking by faith. You can't walk by faith if you're not in the faith, if you haven't obeyed the faith. And so it's time to do that tonight. Tonight it's time to believe in Jesus. Believe in, him as a, believe in him as a son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess him as God's son and be immersed in the waters of baptism. Those are the things you must do to obey the faith and become a Christian. And if we can help you with that in any way at all, 
We're going to sing this song and invite you right now as we stand and as we sing.